My name is Vahid Chisos, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here this morning, this afternoon. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Yeah, how's it going, everybody? My name is Max Garcia, and I'm tuning in from Sydney, Australia. But however, I'm American, just like the majority of you watching here today. Awesome. So, Max, I see a lot of medals. I see a lot of stuff. I know you've done a lot of service and different things. So, thank you for your service. I don't, I don't understand why you would go to Australia, but I'm not going to say nothing. That's for a different live session. I don't know what made you do that, that I you would you. move. <laughs> I can tell you, and I'll tell you the politically correct version of that. So, maybe you remember uh, Bahichi, is that how I say it, right? Bahichi? You're right. Maybe you remember Bahichi, uh, the initial invasion of Iraq in 2003 um, when the U.S. invaded Iraq and, you know, took down that Saddam statue and all that other good stuff. Well, I was there for all of that. And, you know, as we were getting ready to leave, all the Marines were flying home and it was going to be a great time. There's going to be a lot of parties, parades, all these things welcoming the Marines home. And for whatever reason, they came to our company and said, hey, you guys are going to have to take a ship home. It's going to take you an extra two months to get home. Um, but, you know, if you trust God every now and again, if you have a little bit of faith, things, blessings come. And that same ship that we had to take home stopped right here in Sydney, Australia, where I met my wife. And we got married three years later. Uh, after that, she moved with me to the States. We lived in various places such as Florida, Arizona, Spain. So Okinawa. let me get this straight. There was no plane to take? It was going to take you guys two months to get home? Uh, not that it was. It did. It took us an extra two months to get home. But like I said, we stopped in Sydney, Australia for five days. And I met my wife on the last day. And yeah, during the last couple of years of my time in the Marine Corps, I was like, you know what? I really want to move to Australia. I like it down here. I just I fit in. I absolutely love it. It's a great climate, everything. Awesome. So let's dive into the leadership. So tell me about well, what's the definition of leadership in the first place? Because we throw that name, we throw that vocabulary around, but I want to get a get an idea from you that what is the definition of a leader and what's the different de definition of leadership? Right. Well, that's a good one. You know what else? I really don't have a definition of leadership, but I can tell you the difference between a leader and a boss. Okay, a boss. I just kind of see when we use that term, we use it loosely. Somebody who just kind of directs other people, tells them what to do, do this, do that. And it's to meet an end state. Leader is somebody who cares about the people just as much as the mission. So in the Marine Corps, you know, we say, um, you know, mission first. I say mission first, Marines always, or in everybody else's case, mission first, people always. I mean, Yes, your institution. Yes, you're the company you're working for. However, you're not going to get a thing done without your people. And I see this all the time as I'm coaching um, executives, as I'm coaching other leaders, as I'm coaching business owners. And they're wondering why they have a high turnover of people. People are always quitting, having to hire, fire. People are calling in sick unnecessarily. It's because they don't have this thing called loyalty. And a true leader knows how to build loyalty in an organization. That's just a huge piece. Don't get me that's started. A, that's, a, that's, a funny one. that's a funny one that you mentioned um, because Napoleon Hill talked about it in, in multiple videos, especially when he did the law of success and thinking go rich. And I know you're a big fan of, of all those self-development books. He said, if you want to create a mastermind group, the only thing that he's looking for or the main thing that he's looking for is loyalty and skills and talent and capability was third and fourth in his list. He said the number one thing is dependability and loyalty. If those two things are not there, I can care less what they're able to do or not. So the minute you said that, I was like, okay, loyalty is that. So here's my question. How does an individual, so would the prioritization for a leadership or organization to be their, their prioritization should be to create loyalty. How do you go start doing that? Is it just give them more money? No, absolutely not. I mean, of course, a fair pay for a fair wage. Um, but the main thing with loyalty is, is caring about other people in their situation. So here's the thing. Everybody in life, everybody watching us right now, uh, everybody in life 
has been through something, everybody will go through something, and everybody is going to go through something. Or excuse me, everybody has been through something, is going through something, and will go through something. The thing is that they just don't have that written on their forehead or on their t-shirt, whatever their stress is. And when you, as a leader, take five seconds out of your day to say, oh, hey, how's everything going? How's, how's things going with the baby? Are, are you getting sleep? How's your wife doing? Is she, because you know their postpartum depression is a real thing. I just wanted to check and see how you're doing. Or how's your girlfriend or this? Just by saying, you know, inquiring, what we call um, in the Marine Corps, engaged leadership, or I like to say intrusive leadership. Like get in their business, even if they're not crazy about it at first. Because when you find out what their problems are, and as a leader, most likely you know how to help them solve those problems um, because you've been through them. That's why you're in that position. And you take the time out to go, oh, yeah, you know what? I had that health issue too. And I tried this supplement or I did this acupuncture, this place, try that. And then when it works, they say, oh, man, you know, John, my boss, he's a genius. He gave me this great recommendation or whatever. And then, then yeah, then you build this thing called loyalty because you actually care about the person, nothing to do with the job. Or if they say, oh, you know, I'm getting the runaround, um, I don't know, an immigration. And I'm trying to, uh, I mean, I got the runaround. I know, but Max, I don't agree with that, though. For a lot of bosses, a lot of corporation, the minute you get over a hundred, that deteriorates. I mean, you got to be a man on a mission. I mean, I'm just talking about myself. Let's just say I was supervising um, at a company with 300 employees. 300 employees. How the heck am I going to get in everybody's dish with 300 people? So that means I have to teach other people to get into other people's dishes and then be able to kind of have everybody come back. And like, that is not an easy thing. Like, that leader needs to be going out of their way because then I'm thinking they got obligations to the business and job and their own responsibility. Even if you spend five minutes, I mean, I really don't think you can get in somebody's business in five minutes, but let's just say five minutes. And if they do that, let's say 10 per day, that's almost an hour. If I have a hundred employees, that's going to take me, you know, it, it's going to take me half of the year to get to everybody. Yes. So just so you know, I can speak from a point of certainty on this. Uh, before I got out of the Marine Corps, I was a senior enlisted guy for 1,200 Marines. 1,200. And they were sometimes, in, actually, they were often in different locations. So the first thing is that you got to get out from behind the desk. You got to get out from behind the desk. You got to get out there, meet some people, shake some hands. Hey, what's your name? How long have you been with us? You married? Quick five, you know, or, or I like to say, hey, give me this quick 30 seconds about yourself. And then a quick chat. Oh, you're from here. I'm from there too, whatever. First thing is you got to get out from behind the desk and do that though. Preferably in the afternoons when you're dragging after you've had lunch anyways. You don't want to use your morning because the morning is the most productive part of the day. So you get out from behind your desk in the afternoon. And this is not easy. It takes time. Get out there and shake some hands. If you have people in multiple locations, yes, you need to book a ticket and get out there and see them and have a meeting uh, with them and their staff. If they're all in the same location, every single Friday in my battalion, every single Friday we would have what we call Friday formations where we get the whole battalion out there. It didn't matter if it's a thousand people or whatever and have a chat. Hey, this is what we're doing great. This is what we're not doing great. Be careful out there this weekend because it's 4th of July and there's gonna be idiots on the road and don't drink and drive because I value each one of you and I wanna see you back or whatever it is. So. Does that answer your question? Or, or these idiots are not wearing masks. Watch out. So I understand yeah, right. what you're saying. <laughs> right. That's a whole entire different uh, live session that we need to do. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through there right now. Listen, I'm going through the whole, I'm going through the neighborhood, and I'm just thinking with myself, is you having a couple of shots of alcohol or beer or whatever you do at the bar, is it really worth one in a millionth chance of you getting I mean, it's, it's, anyway, don't get me started on that. I can go on for, it's like, really, I, I, listen, I totally understand if you have no regards for your own life. Totally cool. You, you have the freedom to do whatever you want to do with your body. But if your actions are going to have consequences for others, you should be thinking. That's why thinking, that's why Napoleon Hill named it Think and Grow Rich in yeah. all aspects of life. So here's the problem with that. And, since you like thinking grow rich, I'll talk right about that. He, he says uh, in his book, 
Uh, there's one chapter in particular I love. Why men seldom succeed before age 40. 50. Okay? 40 or 50. And, and you know what? The, the killer of, of younger people, meaning people in their 20s, really, the killer of their careers, the killer of their lives, the killer of their relationships revolves around two things, sex and alcohol. Those two things will kill your career, kill your life, um, kill your dreams. The irresponsible uh, use of sex and alcohol will destroy a man or woman, particularly somebody in their, in their 20s and in, thir in their 30s. Now, one thing that the book does not say is that part of this reason is that the male brain does not even fully develop until age 26. And not only that, the part of the male brain that does not fully develop is the part that's responsible for second, third order effects, thinking, thinking through second, third order effects. So a young man doesn't think far down the track, okay, if I get in this car and do this, he doesn't project forward well enough because that part of his brain is not developed if he's 26 or less. This is why that's where the majority of the problems come from. I, I, I kind of agree with that. I don't know that I, I'm not going to put a number on it. If you say 26, I'll go with that. I'm pretty sure it is between 20 and 30. But I was looking to see if he said 40. I read on my book 50, but if you said 40, we'll go but with he 40. Said, he said that the majority yeah, of men I know are not. Seldomly before, I, I, I'm just thinking on my book, did it say 50 or 40? But we could go back and kind of debate on that. But, I mean... I think guys go find love based on what they see. I think females go based on what they hear. So it's like, a, it's a little bit different. But think about this. I don't think, I think, I mean, I don't think Napoleon Hill had adequate time to go ahead and do enough research or elaborate on it because I think it could have been a complete total brand new different book on, on sexual transmutation. It could definitely be that. But my question is, why would anything like that, you know, it's 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 a little bit it's a little bit different, especially for females right now. I think men need to watch out for the individual that they choose for their mate, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever the case might be, right? Because that person influences you a lot in your business side and in your personal side. So it's not the act of sex that Napoleon Hill was talking about. I think, I mean, think about it. When we have sex and we make love, we have the power to create another human being. Yeah. So that process by itself should tell us that it's very powerful because now we can create another human being. So all Napoleon Hill was saying is, listen, you could channel that energy for other use versus just using it in this one area. Because you and I don't use our, our brain only for one activity. We don't use our body for one activity. We don't use our hands for one activity. It's a multi-purpose use. So why not use that energy for other areas? I think that was the message that he wanted. Well, I believe that was the message he wanted to convey. Yes, absolutely. And most younger men are just, you know, wasting that, that energy. And you couldn't be more accurate about choosing your mate, your whoever your significant other is, but also your circle of friends. You are who you hang out with. Like it or not, take the people you spend your most, most time with, average their income, and that's going to be your income like the next five years, maybe even sooner if it's not already there. You hang out with dogs, you get fleas. Instead of hanging out with the dogs, fly with the eagles. Look for people who are already um, have already accomplished what you want to accomplish, who are already headed and close to where you want to be so that you can learn and grow from them as well. And But you need to have something to contribute. I agree with that. Also. So let's talk about mental health. What the hell mental health means? <laughs> yeah, okay, so um, it's a hot topic right now, mental health. And, you know, it's one that I can, can speak on intelligently because of my three combat tours. Uh, two Iraq, one Afghanistan. So I understand mental health. It is it is a challenge. Uh, and I'd say most people face it at some point in time or another. The, the challenge, though, is that people don't talk about it. It's it's There is a stigma associated with it. So you have to Max, they careful. talk more about sex than they talk about mental health. <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, let, when was the last time you went to a conversation to, to, to a gathering where someone was talking about their mental health? Like that, you know, that's not a common topic or conversation. Or I think 
a lot of times I wouldn't want to talk about my mental health with other people because I don't know who I'm talking to. Are they qualified to give me advice? I mean, that's a little bit weird. It hasn't, it's not, you know, I talk about my mental status with the people that I'm hanging out, other coaches, other influences, but not a normal gathering. Right. Well, there, there's, and for me, it's actually something I talk about often in some of my speeches. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that there is a flood of people um, who have a, a mental health challenge, or maybe they're just dealing with something and it's causing them to be depressed. But that doesn't necessarily mean they suffer from depression or that they have a a mental health issue. It's just that they're dealing with a problem that they're letting it get to them. And, you know, if they keep it to themselves, then it's only going to get worse. And you are correct, though. However, be careful who you talk about it with. The other challenge is people are just rambling off complaining at work to people who cannot do anything for them. You know, if you have challenges with mental health, contact me. My um, comment is pinned there below. Contact me. I've been there, done that, not one or two, but three combat tours. We're talking some bloody, nasty stuff that I've experienced and been able to guide myself. So, okay, so Max, I got a question. So why is everybody else not taking these wars the way you've been taking it? What is, is that, what's the difference? Because you see a lot of people, they come back from a war and, you know, we thank them for their service and, and, and their time that they spent over there defending our country or, Whichever country you're from, that's what ends up happening. But you've taken it much better than other people or the average individual. What? Why is that? Right. So, um, and by the way, I want to say for everybody out there, yes, for me, it was a combat-related thing. But for other people, it's different things. For a lot of women, it's postpartum depression. that gets swept under the rug. For other people, it's inherited from their parents or grandparents if their parent or grandparents suffer from some type of mental Ill illness chances are they will too the other kind is people experience some kind of trauma earlier in life whether they're abused or a partner mistreats them when they're younger it could be anything a parent teacher uh, mistreats somebody a, a lot of things so for me the, the way i've been able to uh, help myself is that you know when i when i came back from that uh, deployment in 2004 in particular my second iraq tour uh, we took an absolute beating. I mean, it was bad. And I remember, as I remember shooting my weapon out of the window, thinking, and it was this way, I won't forget because I was a passenger. No, I'm right-handed like most people. I remember shooting this way, thinking that if I make it out of here, I'm going to make the most of myself. And then later I thought, and help as many other people to do the same. I remember thinking that. And 2005, I was really quite a mess from PTSD and didn't even know it. But in an effort to help myself and my Marines, I began to study things like Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, and some of his other books. I began to study things such as hypnosis and how to work with the subconscious mind to achieve anything. I began to um, study the authors in the movie The Secret, which all also came out in the same year. And eventually I ended up writing a book with one of the people who were in the movie. And it was just to study, to help myself as well as my Marines, that's how I got to the point where I'm at. Does that, does that answer your question? Shouldn't, shouldn't the Marines make the make it standard that every Marine should read Thinking Go Rich? But I guess if they read it, most of them will not be in the Marines. They'll just go do business. <laughs> it's less dangerous. Uh, you probably won't get shot at. Uh, your competition will want to put you out of business, but at least you're not you don't have somebody shooting at you. So I totally understand. So okay, if you had to give two tips on how I can improve my mental health by myself, why well, I don't need a coach. What would be to those two advice? Yes. Okay, so first thing is you need to decide what you want because most people are focused so bad on what they don't want. So they're saying, oh, you know, I'm in this bad relationship. And, or, or here's another one. Oh, I'm so unhappy with my health. And people are, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm overweight, I'm fat. I want to get myself in shape. And they're, they're complaining, they're complaining. I want to lose weight, I want to lose weight. And they're complaining about that. But if you focus on weight, that's exactly what you get more of. Your focus should be, I will weigh 135 pounds by December 31st, 2020, or whatever the number is for you. But the same goes for your mental health. So rather than, oh, I'm in this relationship or oh, I'm in this job that's depressing me, instead, focus on what you want, which is the next job or the next promotion or a new relationship. Give yourself a compelling reason, first of all, to look to the future. And the next thing, since you asked me for two things, 
create a step-by-step -step plan to get there. Write as many things as you can do to get there. And if I were to equate it to Think and Grow Rich, which, which I love and you love, um, I will earn this specific amount of money by this specific date. I will do this by taking the following actions. And the same goes through for anything in your life. I will score myself a promotion, new job, new relationship, whatever, by this such such a date, get this weight by this date. And I will do that by taking the following actions. Number one, number two, because once you shift your mind from problem oriented focus to solution oriented focus, your life will never be the same. Oh, uh, totally different. I agree with that 100%. And listen, you're funny study. On, on, on individuals that write their goals down and the people that just to share the act of writing it down has improved uh, so many people's lives. So I totally agree with that. You need to know what you want. I mean, I look at it as, let's say you had a genie in a bottle and you summoned the genie to deliver what you wanted. You can't tell the genie, I wish, I hope this. You got to be a specific. I want this type of a car, this color, this model, with this kind of mileage, with this, you know, body shape, with these type of rims. I mean, you got to get as specific as you can. And and I don't agree. I want to. I want to look. Uh, I want to be 130 pounds. I want to be 130 pounds. This with this much muscle, with this much fat, with yeah. this much. Like you got to be as specific as you can. I'm talking about like hardcore. That's how you got to be. You don't just go say I want to buy a house in this area. You're like, no, I want this is street, this. I want it to be, have it, have somebody live behind me, side me. Uh, do I want to have front yard, backyard, swimming pool? Like, you got to get a specific. And and I tell people the same thing that you're trying to do, you know, with, with, with your clients. If you're not a specific, I can't help you with that. You got to lock yourself up in a room, figure out what the heck that you want, and then come out and then we go after it. But if you don't know what you want, then you got the shiny object syndrome and you're going to look around. If you don't know what type of a house you want to get, your real estate agent will sell your house. It just may not be the house that you wanted. Yes, that's so true. And the thing is that most people are going through life with only a vague and mystic concept in the back of their minds of the things they want to have, do, or become. And then they wonder why year by year goes by and they never get them. They wonder why uh, I make a New Year's resolution on New Year's Eve and vaguely know about it, forget about it. By the time July rolls around, they don't even remember what the New Year's resolution was, let alone if they accomplished it or not, because it's only a vague and mystic concept somewhere in the back of their mind. And you become specific and you write it down in a certain way, which, which I can teach any of you if you contact me, if you write it down a certain way, you look at it a certain number of times a day, so on and so on, you actively pursue it. Um, not just, oh, tucked in, oh yeah, I'd like to get here, you know, someday. Someday is like, never comes. It's like you're going where the, the waves take you. you gotta so that goes to my follow-up question. How do you overcome adversity? Yes, yeah, so how do I overcome adversity? Wow, so first thing is that- I mean, okay, well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna rephrase the question. First, okay. let's, let's talk about what, what are we talking about adversity? When I say that, what do you hear? When I yes, say how do you overcome it, are we talking about racial? Are we talking about cultural? Are we talking about geolocation? What the heck are we talking about? What type of adversity are we talking? Any kind of problem is what I consider adversity. Any kind of problem which we all have had, we all have, and we all will have. Because that's how we learn and go, grow. Excuse me. That's how we learn and grow. First of all, when you have a problem, embrace it, love it, because that's going to help you grow. Now, the next thing is don't focus on the problem kind of like i mentioned before uh so since you mentioned race and you know riots and all these other things uh the focus of the focusing on violence and focusing on um i don't know police brutality focusing on racism focusing on all those bad things is never ever going to create peace focusing on disease is never going to create health Focusing on poverty is never going to create wealth. So the first thing is that if you're having some type of adversity, going through some kind of problem, going through something, which we all do, um, make an effort to not put too much energy into that. Look at that from a calm perspective. You're up here looking down on that problem. Okay, how can I solve this? From a calm, collected 
point of view. Once you get engulfed in it and you're like, oh, that person, ah, oh, they're making me so angry. Well, you're, you've become part of the problem and you're gonna exaggerate the problem. I mean, think, think about this. People who complain about being broke all the time, people who complain that they don't make enough, their wages aren't high enough, the taxes are too high, the economy's not good. People who complain about being broke all the time typically tend to stay broke. And people who complain about being sick all the time, they complain about their ailments that they're so annoying to be around. People who complain about being sick all the time tend to stay sick. So my question is, then why would you ever think or speak about anything other than what you want in life? So that's, that's a big part of adversity. And it, <laughs> there's a lot more steps to it, but that's the number one thing is change your focus. And then- No, I mean, what you said, calm, calm and collected. I mean, it's not easy to do that. I still have, I, I suffer from that, definitely. That is not an easy thing to do. Uh, but I think the first level of awareness comes that, hey, I have these tendencies and I don't want them, so what can I do? It So it's like one of those things that is, that's a true definition of self-development. You know there are, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a challenge. So there is this little equation that I need to solve for myself because I want to get to the other side and on the other side is self-development. So I don't look at it as a problem or a complaining. I'm not like, okay, I got this equation. How do I solve it? But I am aware that there is an equation and I'm also aware that I hold the key for that solution. Yes, absolutely, 100%. And, and it's like a muscle, just like any other muscle that you develop. You know, if you're used to uh, somebody cut you off in the street and you're used to, you honk the horn, you get mad and you flip the finger, well, now you've, you've given your power to that person and they don't even know you. And you've slowed your steady progress towards your goal, towards your next promotion, towards your next raise, towards your relationship. You've slowed that down. You've, you've wounded some of your own health for the future and you don't even know it just by letting your blood pressure go up because of that person in that instant. But when you can control your thoughts, control your feelings, control your actions, you literally control your life. I cannot emphasize this enough. And it's like any other muscle, you get to it. When somebody cuts me off on, on the freeway or something or the computer acts up with, you know, and, and I wanna get mad and throw the thing across the room. Before I get mad, I ask myself, is it worth slowing down my next goal? Is it worth my health getting worse? Is it worth me not getting that next speaking gig or that next coaching client? Is it worth it? And then of course the answer is no. So then I look at it, you know, from a calm point of view, you know, a, a first responder, whether it be police, fire, whatever, responds. They don't react. I learned this from Bob Proctor, by the way. He's an amazing guy as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Some of the he's all right. He's all right. From... I like him. He's cool. He's all I, right. I love him. <laughs> so, you know, a first responder responds instead of react. So when you react to a problem, you, you know, you're, you're losing control. You're losing the problem. You're reacting. And your subconscious mind, since you love Napoleon Hill, you know, when you say, oh, I, I can't get this to work. You're so, I, I can't do math. I'm so mad. I can't do math. Your subconscious mind only hears can't and math. It doesn't know that deep down you'd really like to be able to do it. So as soon as you say, you know, what you speak about, you bring about. What you think about, you bring about. Your subconscious mind says, okay, th that's a command. And therefore, make it happen. So be careful what you think. Be careful what you speak about. Be careful what you do. Because um, that is ultimately going to affect what happens in your life in a massive way. Yeah, I was watching a video online on a different topic and the, the speaker says the words, if you put a, an S in front of it, it will be swords and you should treat them like that. You shouldn't be using your words very lightly. So if That's you put an S at the beginning of it, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very, very, uh, it's powerful what we speak and what we put in the universe. Doesn't matter how you do it. And and Max, here's the crazy one. I, I know we're, we're, on, we're on a time crunch, but it's not even the words that you put out there. It's the words that you have is the other third person that you have in your mind that's talking to you. You gotta watch out for that guy to be using the right vocabulary because you're in control of that guy, but sometimes that guy goes wild and that person is talking to you. So the yeah. way you speak out there, could also coordinate with that. And then, I mean, people need to, listen, how do people find you? That's it. How do people find you so they could get the solution? 
<laughs> right. So I uh, see you pinned the, com the comment I made down below. So contact me at Life Coach 8 if you want to hit me up right here on Instagram. I also have a website which is on that um, on that same page. It's also really if you just Google my name, Max Garcia or Life Coach 8, I've got the website. I'm on all the social media platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, you name it. I'm even on TikTok now, which I don't even know if I belong on there, but I got, I got myself a TikTok Listen, account. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. So here's my question, Max. How did you lose the battle between you and your wife deciding for Australia? I would think she would say, let's go to U.S. So what was the decision making? Did you, did you take it easy on her and just like, you know, honey, I love you, whatever you say? Was that the case? No, nope, I'll never forget it. It was in uh, 2008, and I realized that my parents, uh, I was adopted, so I actually don't know my biological parents, my adopted parents. I knew they were getting older, and I knew they weren't going to be around much longer. And I thought, you know, my family, the rest of my relatives, which I love, they're used to me not being around anyways, because I, I did 24 years in the, in the Marines. And I thought, you know what? I won't forget it. We were visiting Sydney. We're out in the Sydney Harbor. I thought, geez, it's just so beautiful here. I love it so much. And it wasn't me taking it easy. Our plan, and she was happy to retire and live in Southern California. We were, we were going to live in Carlsbad, which is where we lived at uh, twice. I love it down in Southern California. And I thought, you know I what? Mean, San Diego I really is chill. It's very chill. So it's all right. You got the base over there and everything else. I'm cool. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. And um, I, I just, I said to her, you know what? I think I want to move here when, when I get done with the rings. And it was my decision. And it's the best decision I ever made because it's like a, it's almost like I'm in, I don't know, what do you call it? Uh, re rehab. It's like I'm like in, you know, therapeutic you know, mode. It, it's, it's done the world for me, you know, healing me mentally, physically, you know, I'm working on a lot of things. And the people here have been so warm welcoming me. You know, I get asked to do a lot of speaking uh, here and there and a bit of keynote speaking and my coaching business has taken off. The people here have welcomed me with open arms. So I still have my clients in the States that I fly back for to do a speech or consulting um, or I coach with over video. Um, so I love my country. I served them for, for 24 years. So no one can ever take that away. But I'm enjoying my time here so much. It's really relaxing. And I mean, the population is small. The population of the whole country here is like the size of California population for the whole country. So it's, it's awesome. relaxed. Listen, tell your wife I'm up for adoption. And whenever she wants to apply for the papers, uh, you can move you over there. And then I'll do your social media management over there. And I won't cost much. I just go in the wilderness all day long. I, I, I won't bother anybody. You could just feel like you're in retirement. You won't even notice I'm there. That's it. Yeah, no but problem. I've got to check we'll, with my wife first, but yeah. I might be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, sponsor, we'll sponsor you both. You come over and you can stay. Love it, love it. If I come down there, I'm just coming down for the coral and and the and the and the tropical fish, man. I got a big, huge fish tank. So if I come down there, I'm just gonna be going and just checking out all the corals and everything else. But listen, so so tell us, okay. So you said life. So people, individuals can find you on Instagram. Is that where you want us to? You want people to message you for? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Yeah, thanks. Listen, I want to thank you so much for taking this time and and being with us. Hopefully, we'll get to do more videos. Because there are other topics that we didn't, you know, deep dive into. Because there's a lot. Because I think there's a little correlation between the military, all the branches, and business. I think that discipline and what you do over there, the commodity, the the, 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 the team environment, the discipline, the focus, the mission. I think all of that definitely could come into the private sector, and it could help. And also, we could take a lot of stuff from the private sector and implement there. First one being thinking go rich. So um, yeah, huge. There, there's a lot of different topics over there that we need to. Uh, yeah, very, very good point. And, and you know, I want to thank everybody. I see all the hearts going up over and over and over again. I see all the nice comments, people from around the world tuning in here. So I want to thank all of you all as well for, um, for ch checking us out. And you know what? That is a great, great point. By the way, the, the two definitely should mesh together. The thing is we don't teach people in the military how to really use their skills in business and how to explain that and then we don't the, and the military is a bit kind of closed-minded when it comes to thinking grow rich and all these little things except for your individual leaders here and there that are implementing that on their own individual units but um no we'll definitely make it happen i want to thank you so much for being here you stay safe yeah, out you. there and yeah thanks everybody have a great day talk to you soon bye-bye